Hey sweet friends, it is once again time for another thrilling installment of Runaway Ralph by Beverly Cleary. Today we'll be reading chapter 7 titled, The Escape. Ralph was desperate to escape. His food supply was running low, and as Chum had predicted, Garf stayed away from the craft shop. Ralph ran around the sides of his cage, hoping that there might be an opening, one overlooked space wide enough for a mouse to squeeze through. There was none, as he had known all along. He pushed on the door with all his strength, but he could not budge it. He ran on his wheel and hoped that it might just once take him someplace. But of course it did not. Ralph needed help. Hey, chum, he called over to the hamster who was noisily wearing down his teeth on the bars of his cage. You're a stretchy fellow. See if you can stretch over here and pull this door open. For once, chum obliged by putting his shoulder to the bars of his cage, stretching his foreleg as far as he could and reaching with his paw. He barely managed to flick a wire of the side of Ralph's cage with a toenail. There must be some way we can get out of here, said Ralph. There's gotta be. Not for me, answered Chum. I wouldn't leave if I could. I've lived in a cage all my life, and I'm too old to start scrounging. Besides, I rather enjoy trying to bite the hands that feed me. I would rather scrounge than starve, said Ralph. He still had a supply of food, but he pawed through some old sunflower seed husks to make sure he had not missed any edible bits. Over in the dining hall, the campers, unaware that a mouse was soon to starve, sang with gusto. The ants came marching two by two, hurrah, hurrah. The ants came marching two by two, hurrah, hurrah. The ants came marching two by two, and the little one stopped to tie his shoe. As his food supply dwindled further, Ralph felt nervous and guilty. His mother had taught him to store food. The sight of the camper's mosaics made of dried peas and beans was hard to bear. He felt he would no longer object to a little dried glue on his food. When Chum managed to toss an alfalfa pellet into his cage, he was humbly grateful. Outside his cage, the campers went about their activities unaware of the desperate mouse in the craft shop. Lana cradled Katso in her arms whenever she could catch him, and the smug look on that cat's face was unbearable to Ralph. Karen returned to paint her bleach bottle piggy bank. Everyone who passed her work table asked if her watch had been returned, and Karen, busy with her piggy bank, shook her head. Occasionally, Ralph's ears caught the familiar and he looked out to see Garf pushing his motorcycle across a bench or around the edge of the ping pong table as if he were lost in a dream of speed and danger. The sight of his precious motorcycle made Ralph even more frantic for freedom. And then to add to his troubles, there was still Katso, who had been only temporarily amused by the wristwatch and who would sooner or later, Ralph was sure, return to the cage. Ralph felt thin, nervous, and run down. His cage was untidy even by mouse standards of housekeeping. I wish I knew how to stage a jailbreak, he confided to Chum. If there is anything I can do to help, let me know said Chum, and cracked a sunflower seed he had earned that morning when he had stuffed his cheeks until he had fallen to the bottom of his cage. Chum might toss me a sunflower seed instead of those alfalfa pellets, thought Ralph crossly. At rest period, Aunt Jill came into the craft shop to straighten supply shelves. Ralph watched as she sorted dried seeds, which looked delicious, as well as weeds and pine cones. As he watched, he saw a possibility of help. After all, Aunt Jill, unlike most women, was kind to mice. Looking as small and as pitiful as possible, Ralph clung to the bars of his cage. In time, Aunt Jill noticed him. Hello there, little fellow, she said kindly. Ralph made his whiskers quiver. Let me out of here, he said, quite sure the woman could not understand. 
Aunt Jill smiled when she heard the mouse squeak and offered him a sunflower seed, which he snatched and cracked so greedily that he forgot to look pitiful. My, but you're a hungry little fellow, remarked Aunt Jill, but she did not offer him another seed. Instead, when the camp awoke, she called to Garth, who came to the door of the craft shop but did not enter. Your mouse is hungry, said Aunt Jill. Somebody else can feed him, said Garth. He's your personal mouse, reminded Aunt Jill. I didn't take the old watch, said Garth. I don't want to come in there. I am sure you didn't take it, said Aunt Jill calmly, but don't forget that you wanted to be the only one to feed your mouse. He is hungry and his cage needs to be cleaned. Garth hesitated, but entered the craft shop, and while Ralph scrambled around looking for a way out, he slid the bottom from the cage, changed the cedar shavings, and replaced it. He detached the water bottle, filled it at the sink, and was fastening it to the cage when Aunt Jill went out, leaving the boy alone with the two animals. Here at last was the moment Ralph had been waiting for. Say, Garth, he began, but the boy, not expecting the mouse to speak, appeared not to hear. Ralph was desperate. Say, Garth, he said at the top of his mouse voice. When Garth glanced at him, Ralph said as loud as he could, Listen to me! You know that motorcycle you've been playing with? It's mine! Garth stared at his mouth. You're talking, he said in an astonished whisper. I don't believe it! You're talking! Ralph had spoken and Garth had answered. They were both so excited they were speechless. Finally, Garth spoke again. Go on. Say something more. Ralph pulled himself together and remembered why speaking to Garth was urgent. Puh, 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 he sputtered to show Garth what he meant. That motorcycle, it's mine. Puh, 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 puh. That's the noise I make to run it. You're joking. Garth continued to stare at Ralph as if he could not believe what was happening. No, I'm not, said Ralph. I hid it under the bamboo leaves just before that cow cat pounced on me. I hid my crash helmet, too. Your crash helmet? Garth could not help laughing, which of course hurt Ralph's feelings. The boy pulled the motorcycle out of his pocket, studied it, and then studied Ralph. It's the right size, he admitted. If it's yours, where did you get it? Back at the Mountain View Inn. The Mountain View Inn? Garth was surprised. What were you doing there? It is my home, said Ralph with dignity. A boy who was a guest there gave me the motorcycle. No kidding! Garth almost believed Ralph. Let me out of here, pleaded Ralph. I'll show you I can ride it. Garth looked as if he were tempted, but he said almost regretfully, No, you might run away, and I want to keep you. Ah, come on, Garf, coaxed Ralph. Nope, said Garf, and I've got to get out of here. Aunt Jill just left to give me a chance to return that watch, and I don't have it. I don't have it, and I don't know where it is. Ralph saw an opportunity for bargaining. I do, he said. I know where the watch is. Where, asked Garf. Let me out, and I'll tell you, said Ralph. No, said Garth. I'm going to take you home with me. Your mother won't like it, said Ralph. She'll make you get rid of me. He knew by the look on Garth's face that he had struck a sensitive spot, so he continued. She will say I am messy, and she will say I smell. Garth looked uncomfortable. Let me out of here, and I'll show you where the watch is, persisted Ralph. Garth looked as if he might be tempted. He thought a while and said, My mother might let me keep a mouse. It wouldn't hurt to ask, and I don't want to know where the watch is. If anyone saw me trying to return it, they would say I stole it and I didn't. Ralph's hopes dwindled. I know you didn't steal it, he said, because I know who did. Who? Naturally, Garth was curious to know the name of the real thief. Ralph considered. Should he tell or should he not tell? He 
he decided that telling might convince Garf that he was trying to help him. Catso, he said. Catso the cat took it. Garf gave Ralph a look of disgust. Now I know you're lying, he said. What would a cat do with a watch? Ralph was beginning to feel frantic. Pretend it's a mouse. Play with it. Toss it around. You know how cats do. Garf grinned. For such a little fellow, you sure have a big imagination. I'm not imagining it, said Ralph. Catso took it. I saw him. Honest. Ah, you just don't like cats, said Garf and started to leave. Ralph sat miserably back on his haunches. Well, even if you don't believe me, don't forget to feed me. Glad you reminded me, said Garf, and gave Ralph a generous supply of food before he left the craft shop. He paused by the bamboo where he had found the motorcycle, stirred the leaves with his foot, and uncovered the thistle-down lined half of a ping-pong ball, which he picked up and examined. He glanced back in Ralph's direction before he put the helmet in his pocket and went to his lodge. In a few moments, Aunt Jill returned, glanced at the shelf beside Ralph's cage, and frowned slightly as if she were puzzled about something. Ralph settled greedily at his food dish. I'll show that garf, he thought, as he crammed seeds into his mouth with his paws. As soon as I get out of this cage, I'll show him. When Ralph's stomach was comfortably full, he took a long nap. By the time he awoke, the craft shop was empty, the camp strangely quiet. A few chickens scratched under the walnut trees, and the kittens tumbled about trying to catch one another's tails. A horse whinnied in the pasture, but there was no one in sight. Where is everybody? Ralph asked Chum. They've all gone down to the river for a swim and a picnic supper, answered Chum. Peaceful, isn't it? I finally got some sleep in the daytime. In the distance, Sam barked and campers shouted and laughed. Ralph felt so stodgy from overeating that he went for a run on his wheel before he scuttled around the edges of his cage. His search was futile. Garf had replaced the bottom and fastened the door securely. Suddenly, the hair along Ralph's spine began to tingle. Catso! Ralph huddled in the corner of his cage and tried to make himself invisible. Catso squeezed through the hole in the screen and landed with a soft thud on the workbench beneath Ralph's cage. Ralph squeezed himself into a tighter ball. He felt as if the beat of his heart was as loud as the tick of the missing watch. Why couldn't Sam stay home and guard the camp the way he was supposed to? This time, there was no watch to distract Katso. Katso stood with his front paws on Ralph's shelf and sniffed the cage. Then he sat down and calmly began to watch. First his right ear, then his left. The suspense was more than Ralph could bear. Katso stretched out his left hind leg and began to groom his left hind foot. He licked with long, careful licks, combing his fur neatly towards his toes. Suddenly, Ralph had an inspiration. He was about to take a terrible chance, but with no one to protect him from a sneaky cat, he had nothing to lose. Anything was better than cringing in a corner waiting for that beast to wash and comb every hair on his body. Ralph took charge. He left his corner, sprang on his wheel, and raced so fast he looped the loop. That activity caught Katso's attention all right. The cat sat there with his hind leg in the air looking surprised. Ralph leaped from his wheel and faced Katso through his bars. The cat forgot about his grooming and, jumping to his feet, placed his front paws on the shelf and stared into Ralph's cage. Hiding his terror, Ralph stared back. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's a disrespectful mouse, said Katso, and with a swipe of his paw sent the cage flying. Ralph was prepared. He hung on to the bars and braced himself. Water splashed and seeds flew. One corner of the cage 
struck the work table, jarring the bottom loose exactly as Ralph had planned. The cage bounced and landed on its side. Ralph sprang out through what had once been the bottom. This accident was his chance. Katso pounced, but before his paws could land on Ralph, he was thrown off his aim by a sudden hissing sound from above. Startled, he missed Ralph's tail by the width of a whisker. Ralph was startled too, but the unexpected noise did not prevent him from scrambling behind a jar of nails on the work table. When Ralph got up the courage to peek around the jar of nails, he saw Katso staring up at Chum's cage. He heard the hissing sound again and knew that it must be coming from Chum. Good old Chum! Ralph hadn't known that a hamster knew how to hiss. When Katso recovered from his surprise, he was after Ralph, who dashed from behind the nails as the jar was sent rolling across the table. Crash! It landed on the floor and broke, scattering nails across the craft shop. Ralph leaped behind the supplies of beans and peas and hamster food with Katso after him. Jars crashed, bags tumbled and split as they fa fell. Crash! Bang! Smash! Noise and flying glass did not stop Katso. Ralph leaped behind the big spools of lanyard plastic. Katso knocked over the spools and the plastic unreal tangling about his feet. While Katso freed himself from the plastic, Ralph found behind the work table a slanting piece of wood that was a brace between the studs of the rough walls of the craft shop. Ralph ran down the brace as Katso tried to squeeze his head between the edge of the work table and the wall. He could get his head in the space, but not the rest of his body. He pulled back his head and tried to reach Ralph with his paw. Ralph, however, was too far down the brace. Next, Katso leaped to the floor and ran under the table. Ralph scurried up the brace so that he was above the table and beyond Katso's reaching paw. Back to the tabletop went Katso and down the brace ran Ralph, once again beyond the stretch of those curved and groping claws. Frantic with frustration, the cat sprang from the table while Ralph ran up the brace. Once more, Katso reached and stretched and groped. Ralph's courage and confidence had returned. He advanced within half an inch of Katso's longest reach. Katso tried, but could not stretch his floor leg any, his foreleg any farther. Ralph sat down and said, this could go on all day. You might as well give up. You know I'm too smart for you. Katso, after one more effort to stretch farther, withdrew his paw, came out from under the table, and picked his way daintily and disdainfully through the jumble of seeds, nails, and plastic cord, as if the mess was beneath his notice. He held, held his tail proudly erect, but he did not fool Ralph. That cat had been defeated. Katso squeezed out the hole in the screen door. Ralph was safe, safe and free. Now all he had to do was figure out how to get his motorcycle away from Garth, and he would be on his way back to the Mountain View Inn. In the meantime, he settled down to feast on all the seeds that Katso had spilled for him. Yay, I'm so proud of Ralph. He was very smart, very sneaky, and glad that mean old Katso got what he deserved. See you next time, guys.